In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Greetings to my brothers and sisters in Christ on the 17th day of August, in the year of our Lord, 2019. Let us continue the theme we started a couple of segments ago on the hours of the passion of our Lord and Jesus Christ. Today we will meditate upon the 8 p.m. hour, and we begin with the prayer before each hour. O my Lord Jesus Christ, prostrate in your divine presence, I implore your most loving heart to assist me as I meditate on the 24 hours of your most sorrowful passion. In your passion, you, your love drove you to suffer so much in your adorable body and in your most holy soul unto death on the cross. I implore your help, your grace, and your love to have profound compassion and offer a profound understanding of your sufferings as I meditate on this hour. I offer you my desire to meditate on all the hours, even on those I cannot observe. Please accept my desire to meditate on all the hours, even when I must sleep or tend to my other duties. O oh, merciful Lord, grant that my loving desire, united to you, may bring your holy blessings down upon us all. I give you thanks, O oh Jesus, for calling me into union with you by means of prayer. To glorify you, I unite myself with your thoughts, your tongue, and your heart with which I intend to pray. I fuse myself in your will and in your love, and extending my arms to embrace you, I place my head upon your heart and begin. The 8 p.m. hour. The Institution of the Most Blessed Sacrament. My sweet Jesus, love ever inexhaustible, I see that as you finish the legal supper with your dear disciples, you stand up and along with them raise a hymn of thanksgiving to the Father for having given you food. In this hymn, you offer reparation for souls who fail to give thanks to God for all the things he gives them and that sustain their health. O oh, Jesus, this is why in everything you do, touch or see, you always have on your lips the words, Thanks be to you, O oh Father. I too unite it with you, Jesus, take the words from your very lips, and always and in all things I say, thank you for myself and for all. In order to continue to offer reparation for souls who fail to give thanks to God. O oh, my Jesus, it seems that your love has no respite. I see that you have your beloved disciples again sit down. You take a basin of water, wrap a white cloth around your waist, and prostrate yourselves at their feet. You do so with a gesture so humble 
that it draws the attention of all the heavenly inhabitants and enraptures them. The apostles themselves remain almost motionless in seeing you prostrate at their feet. But tell me, my love, what is it you desire? What do you intend to do through such a humble act, an act of humility never before seen and which will never be seen? Jesus replies, O oh, my child, I seek out all souls, and prostrate at their feet like a poor beggar, I am asking, persisting, and crying out to them, as I devise loving stratagems to win them over. Prostrate at their feet, with this basin of water mixed with my tears, I desire to wash them of all imperfection and prepare them to receive me in the most blessed sacrament. I so much cherish this act of them receiving me in the Eucharist, that I do not want to entrust this office to the angels, nor even to my dear mother, but I myself want to purify them in their innermost fibers, and dispose them to receive the fruit of the sacrament. I intend through the apostles to prepare all souls. I intend to offer reparation for all holy works and for the administration of the sacraments, especially by priests that are carried out with a spirit of pride without a divine disposition, and with tepidness. Oh, how many good works reach me more to dishonor me than to honor me, more to embitter me than to please me, more to give me death than to give me life. These are the offenses which saddened me most. Ah, yes, my child, count off all the most intimate offenses they commit against me and offer me reparation with my own will. Console my embittered heart. Louisa. O oh, my afflicted Jesus, I make your life my own, and with you I intend to offer reparation for all of the offenses that you receive. I want to enter into the most intimate recesses of your divine heart and offer reparation with your own heart for the most intimate secret offenses you receive from your dearest ones. O oh my Jesus, I want to follow you in everything, and with you I want to go to all souls who are about to receive you in the Eucharist. And enter into their hearts, to unite my hands with yours, and purify them. I beseech you, O Jesus, with this water and these tears of yours, with which you washed the feet of the apostles, let us wash souls who will receive you. Let us purify their hearts. Let us inflame them, and shake off the dust with which they are sullied so that when they receive you, you may find in them your satisfaction rather than the bitterness you are forced to experience. But, my affectionate and good Jesus, while you are all intent on washing the feet of the apostles, I look at you and I see another sorrow that pierces your most sacred heart. These apostles represent all the future children of the Church, and each of them the series of each one of your sorrows. In some you discover weakness, in others deceit, hypocrisies, and excessive love for personal interests. In St. Peter you discover the lack of resolve and all the offenses of Church leaders. In St. John, 
the offenses of your most faithful ones. In Judas, all of the apostates with the whole gamut of the great evils they commit. Oh, your sorrow is so stifled by pain and love that unable to contain it, you pause at the feet of each apostle and burst into tears, praying and offering reparation for each of these offenses and imploring the appropriate remedy for all of them. Beloved Jesus, I to unite myself to you. I make your prayers, your reparations, and your appropriate remedies for each soul my own. I want to mix my tears with yours, so that you may never be alone but may always have me with you to share in your pains. But, sweet love of mine, as you continue to wash the feet of your apostles, I see that you are now at Judas's feet. I hear your labored breath. I see that you not only cry, but sob. And as you wash those feet, you kiss them and press them to your heart. Unable to speak because of your voice, which is stifled with sobs, you look at him with eyes welled up with tears and say to him from your heart, My child, oh please, I beg you with the voice of my tears, do not go to hell. Give me your soul which I ask of you prostrate at your feet. Tell me, what is it you seek? What do you search for? I will grant you everything you seek, but do not allow yourself to be lost. Oh, please, spare me, your God, this sorrow. And again you press those feet to your heart, but in seeing the callousness of Judas, your heart is cornered. Your heartache stifles your voice, and you were about to faint. My heart and my life allow me to sustain you in my arms. I understand that these are the loving devices you use for every obstinate sinner. Oh, please, love of my heart, I beg you to allow me to go around the earth with you as you partake in your passion and offer reparation for the offenses you receive from souls who are obstinate in not wanting to convert. Wherever there are obstinate sinners, let us give them your tears to soften them and your kisses and loving embraces to bind them to you in such a way that they cannot escape. In this way, you will be consoled in your pain over the loss of Judas. Beloved Jesus, my joy and my delight, I see that your love runs and runs rapidly. You stand up, sorrowful as you are, and you almost run to the altar where there is bread and wine ready for the consecration. Love of my heart, I see you assume an appearance wholly new and never before seen. Your divine person acquires a tender, loving, and affectionate countenance. Your eyes blaze with light more than if they were suns. Your rosy face becomes radiant. Your lips smile and burn with love. Your creative hands assume the attitude of creating. I see you, my love, completely transformed. Your divinity seems to overflow from your humanity. Jesus, my heart and my life, your countenance never before seen draws the attention of all the apostles. They are caught by a sweet enchantment and dare not even breathe. Your sweet mother runs in the spirit to the foot of the altar to admire the portents of your love. The angels descend from heaven, asking themselves, What is this? What is this? 
These are true follies and true excesses of love. A God who creates not heaven and earth but himself, and where? In the most humble of things, in some bread and wine. Oh, insatiable love, while they are all around you, I see that you take the bread into your hands. You offer it to the Father, and I hear your most sweet voice say, Holy Father, thanks be to you for always answering your Son. Holy Father, concur with me in this. One day you sent me from heaven to earth to become incarnate in the womb of my mother and to save our children. Now, allow me to become incarnate in each host, to continue the work of the salvation of my children and become the life of each one of them. Do you see, O oh Father, they remain but a few hours of my life, and who would have the heart to leave one's children alone as orphans? Many are their enemies and passions, and great is the ignorance and weakness to which they are subject. Who will help them? Oh, please, I entreat you, let me remain in each host to become the life of each soul, to be their light their strength, their aid in all things, and to put their enemies to flight. To whom shall they otherwise go? Who will help them? Our works are eternal and my love irresistible. I cannot, nor do I wish, to leave my children alone. The father is moved at the tender and affectionate voice of his son. He descends from heaven and is now upon the altar united with the Holy Spirit. And he concurs with the Son. And Jesus, with a resounding and moving voice, pronounces the words of the consecration. And without leaving himself, he bilocates himself in the bread and wine. Okay, I wish to pause here and reflect on this reality of Christ bilocating himself. Some people don't understand the concept of bilocation and have asked me over the years to better explain it. I have done so in my dissertation and I've done so also in the various works that I put out on the website livinginthedivineworld.org. Now the expression... Jesus, without leaving himself, signifies the act of bilocation. Jesus employs the word bilocate to express the soul's ability to multilocate. He uses this word in relation to God. For example, in volume 28 of Luisa Picaretta's diary on November 30th, 1930, he speaks of God bilocating. He also uses the word bilocation in relation to Adam, who could, by, in quotes, bilocate his soul in all created things. This comes from volume 33, November 10th, 1927. He also uses the word bilocation in relation to Mary. In volume 11, May 9th, 1930, he uses the word bilocation in relation to souls. That is their propensity, like Adam and Mary and Jesus, to be present in several things contemporaneously. This is found in volume 32 on July 8th, 1933, and there are many other references to this word. So the ability to bilocate is not the body's, but the soul's propensity under the influence of God's one eternal act, which is present to all things of all time, to be present to all things of all time. See, bilocation is not a virtue. It's nothing we can do by our own human effort or holiness or achievement. It is a pure gift of God. Unless God gives this gift, and he wants to give it to everyone who is properly disposed, we cannot exercise it. But once God gives us this gift of bilocation, which is actualized in the soul who desires to live in God's will, 
The soul, therefore, is given this gift by God to exercise by loving God in and through all things. So by location is first and foremost an expression and an act of love. That's the first expression when we bilocate. We express our love for God in and through all creatures he made for love of us. So we are in essence, therefore, requiting God for the love he put in us and in all things when we bilocate our souls in and through all things for the love of God. To make it more simple, consider a child. Consider yourself a child which is really the theme of today's Gospel reading. Jesus tells the apostles not to send the children away because the kingdom of heaven is like such as these, like little children. So consider yourself a child, and um, you are about to experience Christmas. It's Christmas Eve, and any moment Santa's going to come and put toys around the tree. So you think. Now, if you don't behave properly, you may get a lump of coal in your sock, Christmas stocking. And if you have behaved, you just might get the thing you desire. Now, that gift that you are expecting under the Christmas tree is the gift of bilocation. You've done nothing to merit it, and unless God bestows it, you cannot exercise it. But given the fact that God wants all his children to receive this gift, all his children should expect to receive it if they are properly disposed, that is, if they have behaved properly. Once this gift is received, what happens? You unpack it, take off the Christmas wrapping, open it up, and to your surprise, it's exactly what you asked for. Well, the gift of bilocation, analogously, is that which humanity has been asking for for the past 2,000 years when saying the Our Father. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So now God is answering this petition of the church recited for 2,000 years every day in restoring it to human nature. But we must be properly disposed to receive and exercise it. And what do we do to do to be properly disposed and exercise it? If not, number one, to be in the state of grace. Number two, to desire the gift. Number three, to know more of it each day. And that's it. Desire, knowledge, is what is really sufficient to receive this gift of bilocation which is God's gift to us. God is acting through us when we love him in and through all creatures. Remember the soul, not the body, bilocates. But the soul cannot bilocate unless God gives it this gift which he wants to. And when we love God in and through all things, when we're doing our acts of bilocation, we're aware that these aren't simply acts in and of themselves that we're asked to do only. No. These are acts that have the power to transform the cosmos. So when we are doing our, our acts of bilocation throughout the cosmos, throughout creation, we are aware, mindful, that it is God who is loving in and through us. And therefore, when we place, I love you, God, in the sun, I thank you for its warmth, its heat, its light, that sustains me, that sustains all things that sustain me, including water, plants, animals, etc. I thank you in the waters. I thank you in the skies, in the seas, all of which are expressions of the attributes of God. In one of my previous segments, I talked about how creation is the extension, the physical immersion in God's divine being of the invisible God we cannot see. And even the psalmist speaks about how creation is a 
summoning of nature back to God. God created all things to reflect a quality of his divine being. So water respects the oceans, the seas reflect the immensity of God, for example. And the sun, his eternal transcendence and providence, and so on and so forth. So when we do our acts of bilocation, which are also known as the rounds in creation, we are exercising this gift that is freely given in love in order to requite the love God put in creation. We're requiting the love God put in creation out of love for God. So let us go back to this meditation where Christ bilocates himself in the bread and the wine out of love for us to give glory to the Trinity. So Christ, conti Louisa continues to relate, he then administers himself to his apostles. And I believe that our Heavenly Mother is not deprived of receiving him. O oh, Jesus, the heavens bow down, and all send you an act of adoration in your new state of complete self-emptying. O oh, sweet Jesus, your love remains pleased and satisfied as you have nothing left to do. But I see on this altar, my love, hosts that will be consecrated until the end of time. I behold, lined up in each host, your entire sorrowful passion, as souls at the expense of the excess of your love prepare you for you the excessive ingratitude and enormous crimes. And I, heart of my heart, want to be always with you in each tabernacle, in all the pyxes, and in each consecrated host that will exist until the end of the world to offer you my acts of reparation that correspond to the offenses you receive. O oh, Jesus, as I contemplate you in the most blessed sacrament, I kiss your majestic forehead. But in seeing, in kissing you, I am pierced by your thorns. Let me pause here again for a little bit of clarification on this last expression of Louisa, where she says, as I contemplate you in the most blessed sacrament, I kiss your majestic forehead. Louisa's acts of reparation that correspond to the offenses Jesus received derive from her contemplation. This is important. When we are meditating on the hours of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are in essence contemplating. So Louisa says, as I contemplate you in the most blessed sacrament, I kiss your majestic forehead. Here she uses her mind's eye, or interior vision, to envision Jesus in his passion. In fact, in her Christmas novena, Louisa Hoffman affirms that through her passive imagination, she envisioned Jesus in the, most, in the Blessed Mother's womb, and accordingly made reparation. All right. So she continues, she, she kisses his majestic forehead, and in kissing you I am pierced by your thorns. O oh, my Jesus, in the sacred host, how many souls force such thorns upon you? They come before you, and instead of offering you the homage of their good thoughts, offer you their evil thoughts. You in turn lower your head as you do in your passion to receive and bear the thorns of these evil thoughts. O oh, my love, I draw close to you to share in your sorrows. I fuse all of my thoughts in your mind to remove these thorns that deeply sadden you. May each of my thoughts flow in each one of your thoughts to offer reparation for each evil thought and to alleviate your afflicted thoughts. 
Now, these afflicted thoughts, Louisa here refers to, in Italian, are mesti pensieri. These afflicted thoughts, mesti pensieri, Louisa refers to, constitute all the evil thoughts of mankind that Jesus assumed to expiate and reorder, thereby providing mankind with a twofold grace. One, not to sin through his thoughts, and two, to unite his every thought to God's divine and uncreated intellect. This is found in volume 16 of Louise's diary, March 22, 1924. So Christ, therefore, obtained through his passion all the grace necessary for all human beings of all time not to sin through their thoughts and also to unite every one of their thoughts to God's divine and uncreated intellect. And if there is reason for someone not to unite his or her thoughts to God's divine and uncreated intellect or to sin through their own thoughts, it is due to no fault of Christ. It is rather due to the perverted human will of which we are responsible. Jesus, my love, I kiss your beautiful eyes. I see you lovingly gaze upon those who come into your presence, eager to receive an exchange of their gazes of love. But how many come before you who, instead of looking at you and searching for you, look at things to distract them, thereby depriving you of the pleasure you would have received from an exchange of loving gazes. You cry, and as I kiss you, I feel my lips wet with your tears. Beloved Jesus, do not cry. I fuse my eyes in yours to share in your sorrows and cry with you and to offer reparation for all distracted gazes, I offer you my gazes that are always fixed on you. Jesus, my love, I kiss your most sacred ears. I now see you eager to console souls, listening intentively to what it is they ask of you. But they offer you ear, your ears prayers that are poorly recited, without any trust and out of habit. In the sacred host, your hearing is offended more than in your very passion. O oh my Jesus, I take all the harmonies of heaven and fuse them in your ears to offer you reparation. I fuse my ears in yours, not only to share in your sorrows, but to offer you my continuous acts of reparation to console you. Jesus, my life, I kiss your most sacred face. I see it bleeding, bruised, and swollen. O oh, Jesus, souls come before you in the most blessed sacrament, and with their indecent postures and evil conversations, instead of giving you honor, offer you slaps and spittle. You receive them with complete peacefulness and patience, and you bear everything as you do in your passion. O oh, Jesus, I want to place my face close to yours, not only to kiss you and receive the insults your children thrust upon you, but to share in all your sorrows. With my hands I caress you, wipe off the spittle, and press you tightly to my heart. I also offer you the many tiny particles of my being by placing them before you like genuflected statues, and my movements as they that continuously prostrate themselves before you in reparation for the irreverence you receive from souls. 
beloved Jesus, I kiss your most sacred lips. I see that in descending sacramentally into the hearts of your children, you are forced to rest on many sharp, impure, and evil tongues. Oh, how embittered you are. You feel as though poisoned by these tongues, and it is even worse when you descend into their hearts. O oh, Jesus, if it were possible, I would enter the mouths of each soul to turn into praises all of their offenses against you. My weary and good Jesus, I kiss your most ho sacred neck. I see it is tired, exhausted, and completely absorbed in your crafting of love. Tell me, what do you intend to do? And Jesus, my child, in this host, I work from morning till evening, forming chains of love. As souls approach me, I bind them to my heart. And do you know what they do to me? Many forcibly wrest themselves free and shatter my loving chains. And since these chains are linked to my heart, I feel tortured and become delirious. In breaking these my chains, such souls render my crafting of love useless, as they seek to be bound by the chains of creatures, and they do this in my very presence using me in order to achieve their own ends. This grieves me so much that I undergo a violent fever and I grow faint and delirious. I wish to pause here to reflect upon this tragedy Jesus' affirmation of human beings linked and bound to his heart offers a compelling insight into the human heart's function. Having been a student studying biology, medicine at the university before entering the priesthood, <clears throat> there is a um, correlation between Christ's divine heart and its sentiments and the human heart's function in relation to human nature. For example, Medical research, research indicates that the heart contains a cell type known as intrinsic cardiac androgenic, ICA, which synthesizes and releases neurotransmitters once thought to be produced only by neurons in the brain and nerve ganglia. Now, this had led several scientists to contend that the heart not only can process information, the human heart can not only process information, and make decisions independent of the brain. But in an unborn fetus, the heart starts beating before the brain has been formed. This is a process in medicine known as auto, um, autorhythmic. Yes, autorhythmic, as I recall. If in science the heart emerges as the dynamic and anatomical principle of human nature, in Louisa's text, Jesus' heart emerges as the dynamic and order anatomical principle that binds all humans to his mystical body. So see the correlation between the heart's function in relation to human nature and Christ's divine heart in relation to all souls? It's very clear. So when Christ says these chains of his love are linked to his heart and he feels tortured and becomes delirious when souls rest themselves free from these chains he is speaking literally okay, let me pause here and remind you of the um, importance of supporting Radio Maria we bring you this broadcast in gratitude to you for your support Please continue to support us so that we may continue to provide you with good Catholic teachings rooted in sacred scripture and the magisterium. So after Jesus reveals to Louisa his great sorrow, which is the fruit of irreverence before him in the Blessed Sacrament and sinfulness, 
Louisa relates, I unite myself completely to your passion, O Jesus. Your love is cornered. To console you for the offenses you've received from souls, I ask you to chain my heart with the very chains that were shattered by these souls. In this way, I can requite you with my love on their behalf. Beloved Jesus, my divine archer, I kiss your bosom. The fire you contain is so great that in order to gently vent your flames and seek the slightest respite from your labor, you begin to play, shooting loving arrows from your bosom at souls who approach you. Your game is to form loving arrows, darts, and javelins, and with these pierce their hearts, which causes you to rejoice. But many reject them, O Jesus, by sending you in return arrows of insipidness, darts of lukewarmness, javelins of ingratitude, thus leaving you so afflicted that you weep bitterly. O oh, Jesus, here is my bosom ready to receive not only your arrows destined for me, but those destined for but rejected by others, so that you will no longer lose at your game of love. I offer you reparation also for the insipidness, lukewarmness, and ingratitude of souls. O oh, Jesus, I kiss your left hand and I wish to make reparation for all the illicit or blameworthy touches in your presence. And I beg you to press me always tightly to your heart. O oh, Jesus, I kiss your right hand, and I intend to make reparation for all the sacrileges, especially for the masses poorly said. How many times, my love, are you compelled to descend from heaven into unworthy hands and hearts? Although you are nauseated in those hands, love forces you to stay. What is more, in some of your ministers you discover those who renew your passion. On account of their enormous crimes and sacrileges, they renew the deicide. Jesus, I am frightened at the thought of it. But alas, just as you were in the hands of the Jews during your passion, so you remain in these unworthy hands like a meek lamb, awaiting again your death. Oh, Jesus, how much you suffer. Your love for a loving hand to free you from these sacrilegious hands. O oh, Jesus, when you are in these hands, I bid you summon me to your side to offer reparation by covering you with the purity of angels and anointing you with your own virtues. By this means, the nausea you experience in those hands will be lessened. I offer you my heart as a shelter and refuge, and while you are in me, I pray for priests so that they may be your worthy ministers. O oh, Jesus, I kiss your left foot. I offer reparation for those who receive you out of habit and without the proper dispositions. O oh, Jesus, I kiss your right foot. I offer reparation for those who have been receiving you offend you. And when they dare to do this, so oh, I beg you to renew the miracle you performed with longiness, just as you healed and converted him at the touch of the blood which gushed forth from your heart, pierced by his lance, so at your sacramental touch convert your offenders into loving worshippers and their offenses into acts of love. O oh, Jesus, I kiss your heart, into which all offenses pour, and I offer reparation for them all, to requite you in love on behalf of all souls, and to share always in your sorrows. 
O heavenly archer, if any offense escapes my acts of reparation, I entreat you to imprison me within your heart and within your will, so that nothing escapes me. I implore my sweet mother to keep me always within her heart, so that I may offer reparation for all offenses on behalf of all souls. Together we shall kiss you, and keeping you sheltered, drive from you the waves of bitterness souls offer you. O oh, Jesus, please remember that I too am a poor prisoner. It is true that your imprisonment in the small circumference of a host is more arduous than mine, but I nevertheless bid you enclose me in your heart and with your chains of love do not just imprison me, but also bind one by one my thoughts, my affections, and my desires. Chain my hands and my feet to your heart, so that I may have no other hands and feet but yours. And so, my love, my prison will be your heart. My chains will be formed by your love. Your flames will be my food. Your breath will be my breath. And the bars preventing me from leaving will be your most holy will. In this way I will behold nothing but divine flames and experience nothing but the divine fire. While I experience life, I will also experience death, just like the death you experience in the sacred host. I will give you my life, and while I remain imprisoned in you, you will be set free in me. Was this not your intention when imprisoning yourself in the host? Did you not intend to be set free by those souls who would receive you and enable you to actualize your life in them? And as I cleave to you and embrace you, as a sign of your love, I ask for your blessing and a kiss. O oh, my sweet Jesus, I see that after you have instituted the most blessed sacrament and have seen the enormous ingratitude and offenses of souls at the expense of the excess of your love, though wounded and embittered, you do not draw back. Rather, you desire to immerse everything in the immensity of your love. O oh, Jesus, as you administer yourself to your apostles, I see that you tell them that they too must do what you have done, and you confer upon them the authority to consecrate. You therefore ordain them priests and institute the other sacraments. You tend to everything and offer reparation for everything. the sermons poorly preached, the sacraments administered and received without the proper dispositions and therefore without their intended effects, the mistaken vocation of priests on account of the ordin ordinand and of the bishops who ordain them, who do not use all the necessary means required to discern true vocations. Jesus, nothing escapes you, and I follow you and offer reparation for all these offenses. Then, after you have fulfilled everything for the institution of the sacraments, you take your apostles with you and set out for the Garden of Gethsemane to begin your sorrowful passion. I will follow you in everything to keep you faithful company. Now, before going on to the reflection and practices composed by St. Hannibal and 
a friend of his. I want to go over just a few things here that we just meditated upon. First, Louisa wants to offer reparation to Jesus in everything. And she begins to list those things that come to her mind. For example, the sacraments administered and received without the proper dispositions and therefore without their intended effects. Now, the Council of Trent here teaches that grace is always conferred by a sacrament in virtue of the rite performed. Now, this is known in Latin as ex opere operato. For every sacrament administered confers the grace intended by the sacrament. That's what the Council of Trent teaches. So the sacraments, when they're validly administered, administered, administer also grace. But if the person is not properly disposed, it is sort of like water being poured out over a rock instead of over a sponge. The grace is given, the water is poured out, but it's more or less received according to the dispositions of the recipient. So although the administration of the sacrament is guaranteed, its fruitful or worthy reception depends on the worthiness of the recipient. And this is known in Latin as ex opere operantis. And the Council of Trent was careful to know that there must not be any obstacle to grace on the part of the recipients who are to receive the sacraments, and declared it erroneous to assert that the sacraments require no previous disposition. All right. Another thing I want to point out is this expression of Louisa in her poor Italian Apulian dialect, where she says that she offers reparation for mistaken vocations of priests on account of the ordinant and of the bishops who ordain them, who do not use all the necessary means required to discern true vocations. Now, this expression, mistaken vocations, is oftentimes misinterpreted. Mistaken vocations conveys the inadequate presbyteral formation for, the, for ordination, the lack of which does not necessarily invalidate the conferral of the sacrament of holy orders. This is important. Insofar as there is present in the conferral of the sacrament matter and form that determine its validity, even though a validly ordained priest may depart from the standard of virtue expected of him, or even may leave the church, he retains his priestly powers to consecrate. The Catholic Church teaches that as, as an article of faith that the sacrament of holy orders imprints on the soul of the recipient a character that can never be erased. So mistaken vocations doesn't mean that um, they're not ordained. It means that they were not sufficiently prepared for ordination, you see? Because once you're ordained, you're ordained a priest forever. Even if you leave the church, you still have those powers. All right, on to the reflection and pious practices. Jesus is hidden in the host to give us life to all. Okay, I just noticed that my time is up, my brothers and sisters. So let me reserve this reflection and pious practice to the next segment. Till next Saturday, may God love you and keep you in his most holy will, now and always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.